the feminists believe that women are victims of the patriarchy. And it's, it's up to new laws and the Constitution to remedy this second-class citizenship of women. Absolutely false. The American women are the most fortunate class of people who ever lived on the face of the earth. We can do anything we want to do. Thank you very much, Mallory Factor, for all of those nice words. And uh, thank you, students, for caring to learn about details of American history uh, that may not be in your textbooks. And thanks to the guests who are coming today. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about uh, some other sidelights of the issue that other speakers may not have covered. You know, you've had all of these uh, distinguished lecturers who, who have preceded me in these series, and I'm sure you've read all the books that they recommend, Edmund Burke and John Locke and Russell Kirk and Ludwig von Mises and John Adams and Blackstone. And uh, those are the scholars who uh, laid the foundation for what we understand as the conservative movement. But today I want to take an example of something really that has nothing to do with the conservative movement, but shows you how technology can do a leap forward uh, that could not be done in every other way. In 1975, uh, the people who were meeting and talking about their gripes against the British crown were all trying to make the king shape up and be a good fellow and recognize their rights. Uh, they, all of their entreaties were addressed to the king. And the idea of not having a king really hadn't occurred to them. When they had their convention in, 19, uh, uh, in uh, 1775, uh, I think their, uh, uh, their petition was called the Olive Branch Petition. They're continuing to make entreaties to the king uh, to give them their uh, Englishman's rights. That was in July of 1775. In January of, 19, of 1776, a little pamphlet was published. It was called Common Sense by Thomas Paine. It was only 46 pages. It wasn't written in the scholarly method of those other writers who wrote at that time. It was written for the guys who went to the coffee shop, the, the guys who went to the pub. It was in plain language for plain people. And uh, basically he said, we've got to get rid of the king. And uh, it was published January 10th, 46 pages. And by July the 4th, we had the Declaration of Independence. It's one of the most amazing literary accomplishments in literature. And it probably is the best-selling book in history, considering the population that we had in, in, at that time. Uh, it, it, had, it, it, it gripped people. It created the movement for independence. It was something like, uh, it was a different technology. It was something like moving from the horse and buggy to the automobile, or from the typewriter to the internet. That's what the pamphleteer did. Uh, he made it the pamphlet of the new technology, the language of ordinary people. He didn't, didn't have his piece decorated with uh, Latin phrases. It was, it was just direct political language that anybody could understand. Now let's fast forward to uh, the 1930s, the time of the Great Depression, high unemployment, even worse than today. Uh, but even then, Americans were not looking to government to solve their problems. Uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was uh, expected to be and was elected president in 1932, supposedly to uh, end the Depression, ran on the Democratic platform. And let me tell you what that 1932 Democratic platform said. We advocate an immediate and drastic reduction of government expenditures by abolishing useless commissions and offices, consolidating departments and bureaus, 
at eliminating extravagance to accomplish a saving of not less than 25% in the cost of the federal government. We favor a federal budget annually balanced. Well, that sounds like the Tea Party, doesn't it? It certainly doesn't sound like the New Deal, uh, which uh, Professor Folsom, I think, explained to you in a previous lecture. FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, knew that the American, that was what the American people wanted to hear. However, once he was elected, he embarked on a big spending program, expanded bureaucracy, use of the Commerce Clause to do all kinds of things that uh, we thought then and now think are unconstitutional. The same arguments that are used in the uh, Obamacare case uh, that was argued before the Supreme Court last week. By the time FDR ran for his third term, uh, prominent Democrats had uh, left him. Uh, the American people really hated FDR, uh, very much like the uh, significant number of people who really uh, hate Obama today. Nevertheless, they elected him four times. And that does not mean that people approved of his uh, spending programs and what he was doing. He certainly did not solve the unemployment problem. Uh, as uh, Professor Folsom has explained to you, he spent the money in states where they would get him votes to be reelected. But uh, they, um, uh, 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 continued um, to, to do the spending and continue to be reelected. And then another thing happened, uh, which uh, brought a very little book to the fore. It was written by an Austrian named uh, Frederick Hayek, uh, who had become a British citizen. And it's a very short book in which he directly attacked uh, collectivism, the planned economy, and the whole idea that central planning was the way to run an economy. <clears throat> and he took the position that in order to preserve liberty, uh, we had to make a choice. Do we want the government to plan everything, or do we want to have the rule of law? It sounds like Ron Paul, really, the way it was written. But in any event, the initial printing was only 2,000 books. And then something happened to bring it to the grassroots. And that was that the Reader's Digest reprinted it. Now, it's hard to remember to, or th believe today, but the Reader's Digest then had five million subscribers. And everybody read the Reader's Digest in those years. And uh, so this reached the, the plain people, the uh, grassroots. And they believed it. And it had a, a tremendous impact on our country in explaining what was wrong with the New Deal and how we did, want, uh, did not want to go uh, to uh, central planning of our economy. Now, I happened to be at uh, the Harvard Graduate School that year. And uh, don't let anybody tell you that opportunities for education for women only started when the feminists came along because uh, I was getting my degree at the Harvard Graduate School in 1945, long before all these feminists were born, and <coughs> competed with all the guys, had no problem. And uh, Hayek came there to speak on his cross-country tour. And um, I remember how the professors gathered us to explain to us how we were not supposed to believe what Hayek was saying. They were preparing us for his coming and how to refute him and to answer him. And uh, they were all New Dealers, my professors at Harvard then. I remember one whose favorite saying was, uh, we shouldn't talk about balancing the budget. We should talk about budgeting the balance. And then we had another one who, uh, who devoted one whole lecture in his constitutional law class to telling us that Henry Wallace was the greatest political thinker of the 20th century. Now, if you studied your history, you know he was the closest thing to a communist we ever had anywhere near the White House. And uh, he was so uh, way out left wing that uh, he was too bad even for Roosevelt, who dumped him as vice president uh, when he ran for his fourth term in 1944 and replaced him with Harry Truman. But at any event, the conventional wisdom 
in America then was that the planned economy was the wave of the future and the way to go. And um, the, uh, was, there was a lot of opposition that was building to uh, Roosevelt. Um, there were a number of organizations f uh, organized by the grassroots to oppose him. Uh, there are only two that I know that have survived till this day. One is the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, which is the uh, conservative uh, doctors, and they filed three briefs in this Obamacare case, but they started in the mid-1940s. And the other is America's Future, uh, which still publishes a newspaper and still is around, uh, but most of the others died out. And um, so what was the kind of opposition, political opposition to all this? Well, uh, you look to the Republican Party. Now, the Republican Party in those years was pretty well run by what we call the Kingmakers. And they were headquartered in New York and particularly in the Chase Manhattan Bank. And they thought uh, uh, they were divinely appointed to select a Republican nominee uh, which would who would not very much challenge what Roosevelt was doing. In 1940, they forced on the Republicans a man named Wendell Wilkie, who wasn't even a Republican. He had been a Democrat. And uh, he was kind of a 90-day wonder. Uh, they enlisted all the media. Uh, they did a lot of crooked things, and they put him over as the nominee. And he ran for president on the Republican ticket and lost to Roosevelt. And then in 1944, uh, they tried uh, a, uh, a governor, former governor of New York named Tom Dewey, uh, the one whom uh, I th uh, somebody called uh, looking like the, the little man on the wedding cake. And uh, uh, he didn't do very well in 44. And then came 1948, and they had the gall to nominate Tom Dewey again which uh, we, the grassroots, were very much opposed to, uh, but they forced him on us. And uh, uh, there was a lot of opposition to the grassroots. I remember Alice Roosevelt Longworth said, you can't make a souffle rise twice. But at any rate, uh, 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 Tom Dewey was the candidate. And uh, there were all kinds of wonderful issues that he could have talked about. The Truman scandals, the Korean War, the communist infiltration of our government, the Alger Hiss case. But Tom Dewey waged a Me Too campaign, and he lost. And Roosevelt was elected for his uh, fourth term. Then came 1946, the off-year election. And this, by this time, the grassroots were really getting angry about the whole thing. And they went out and uh, carried on a campaign under the slogan, Had Enough. And they elected what was the biggest Republican majority in Congress uh, uh, in um, the 20th century. So as we approach the, uh, approach the Republican Convention of 1952, everybody expected a Republican year. And the con contestants uh, were uh, Bob Taft, Senator Bob Taft, who had the support of the grassroots and was, I think, the first authentic conservative, as we understand it, in the uh, modern terminology. However, I can tell you, in those days, nobody called themselves conservatives. It was not a word that we used. He was just a run-of-the-mill, garden-variety Republican. And the kingmakers put up Eisenhower, who was a military hero, whom they had installed as a university president to keep him safe until the time of the convention so that he wouldn't have to take any uh, stands on controversial issues. But the grassroots wanted uh, Bob Taft because he spoke up for uh, typical American values, foreign and domestic. And uh, he had uh, uh, his book, A Foreign Policy for Americans, another short book which uh, we liked and we distributed and he was the guy uh, we hoped to uh, nominate in 1952. Uh, well, if, um, if you read about it, you can find that it was another one of these crooked conventions. And 
the, they succeeded in, uh, in nominating Eisenhower uh, after they went to the governor of California, who was then Earl Warren, and promised him the next vacancy on the Supreme Court if he would deliver the big California delegation for the vote on the Credentials Committee and the vote on the Rules Committee, both of which they had changed. And he did, and uh, uh, I, the Eisenhower was not part of the deal, but he was persuaded to fulfill uh, that uh, commitment that his handlers had made, and uh, it was a terrible, terrible mistake because the Eisenhower court uh, was really the beginning of all of these bad decisions we began to discuss uh, later and find out what was happening. In fact, later on, Eisenhower was asked one day, did you make any mistakes while you were president? And he said, yes, two, and they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. <laughs> <coughs> uh, but um, anyway, um, I, we, Eisenhower was nominated, and we all supported him, and he won. Uh, but after that, we began to realize the enormity of the communist threat, both the Soviet missile threat and the infiltration of our government by communist spies and people who were spreading our secret information to the Soviet Union. There was also infiltration in the universities uh, and in Hollywood. And we had v investigations of communism by the various uh, congressional committees uh, and uh, reports that were widely read by the American people. In those days, everybody could read. And it's not like today where we have all this uh, widespread illiteracy in our country. But everybody could read, and they did read the congressional reports. And uh, they uh, understood what communism was and um, why we wanted to uh, get rid of the infiltration in our government. Because the grassroots took up the study of communism from the congressional reports. Now, in 1956, there's one man, again, you, you talk about what one person can do, but one man named Fred Swartz had an enormous impact in building the conservative movement. He was an Australian physician who was invited one day to, be, to debate a communist, and he beat him, and then he realized how evil communism really is. And he realized that the United States was the main battleground. So he came to this country, and he worked in this country for 50 years. He had an enormous impact in building the start of the conservative movement. He brought thousands of people into what we didn't call the conservatives. Again, we're not using the term conservative, but it was the anti-communist movement, so that we had a grassroots that was well, in, well informed. And I got him to put on his first um, school. He conducted these five-day schools, nine to five, all on communism. He'd have a couple of other speakers, gave uh, several of the speakers' speeches himself, uh, but he had other distinguished speakers on the subject. And I assisted him in putting on the first one in 1956 at the Tower Grove Baptist Church in St. Louis. And he realized what he could do by training people with a five-day class. So he then had them all over the country. And all the time I meet people who came into the conservative movement attending one of the Swartz schools. It, it was such a big thing that when he got to California, he filled the Los Angeles sports arena with 16,000 people for one of his schools. Now, uh, his, um, uh, he uh, ultimately has a book that ought to be in your library uh, called You Can Trust the Communists to be Communists. In other words, the con un unlike some of our enemies today, the communists told us exactly what they were going to do. We are going to bury you. And he told us exactly how they were going to do it. And the reason his book, which probably didn't have a big sale, uh, but the reason it's so readable is it was all his speeches. And a lot of books which start out as speeches are much more readable for the grassroots and ordinary people. And he called his organization the Christian Anti-Communism Crusade. So it had a certain evangelical 
uh, aspect to it. So at the end of this first school, I said, well, we've got to bring the Catholics in, too, and have them join. No, he said, you can't put the Catholics and the Protestants in the same room. It just isn't going to work. The Catholics will have to have their own organization. So we got the Catholics to start their organization called the Cardinal Manzetti Foundation. And we promoted study groups all over the country. And at one time, I think we had 5,000 of these study groups because it was based on the congressional uh, uh, reports. And I repackaged it for a Repu Republican Federation, uh, for the DAR, and for the Catholic group, which was called the Cardinal Manzetti Foundation. So people were learning, learning about government, learning about our enemies, learning about communism all the time. And just to show you <clears throat> what the ordinary Republican in those days, we're talking about the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, thought, uh, I, I looked up some of the resolutions passed by the Illinois Federation of Republican Women, which was just, you know, they're just ordinary uh, w uh, women Republican volunteers who uh, like to be supportive and support their candidates in politics. <clears throat> and they had resolutions against the centralization of power in Washington, against UN treaties and UNESCO, against the drive for disarmament. They had resolutions that demanded victory over communism, full support of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. They had a resolution to stop all federal aid to education, wipe it out. They had resolutions which condemned the Supreme Court decisions that were siding with the communists. They had resolutions which condemned the accumulated power in the executive branch and the president, the sprawling bureaucracy, the weakening of constitutional restraints that, that permitted advocates of socialism and communism to make inroads in national security, and further and then, uh, resolutions against the further centralization of power in the federal government. Again, nobody used the word conservative. They were just garden variety Republicans. It sounds like kind of like Ron Paul today. Uh, but nobody called them extremists. That's just the way people thought, especially in the Middle West. And uh, uh, our files have a whole file of letters from congressmen th saying, thank you for sending us this resolution. We agree 100% with it. And, and that was the thinking of people in those days. Now, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that they were, we were worried about in those days were the bad Supreme Court decisions that were siding with the communists. And even the American Bar Association was on our side in this fight, even the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association had a committee that put out this report on communist tactics, strategy, and objectives which set forth 10 of the worst pro-communist decisions of the Supreme Court. This was put in the congressional record, first by Senator Bridges and then later by Senator Dirksen. And <clears throat> I'll bet millions of copies went out. It became a major vehicle to educate the grassroots about what the court was doing about communism. <clears throat> and in also in those years, uh, one, of the, one of the most popular speakers was Dean Clarence Mannion of the Notre Dame Law School. And he wrote a little book, less than 100 pages, called Key to Peace, and uh, talked about the re religious foundation of our country and uh, the, the, a lot of the conservative ideas that we have today. Uh, again, we're not using the term conservative, but this is just the way uh, people believed and thought in those uh, years of the, of the late 50s and uh, early 1960s. <clears throat> and then we looked around for a president. And who were going to run for president? And somebody suggested a senator from Arizona. Well, not nobody from Arizona had ever been elected president before. This guy, uh, Arizona, why, you know, at that, at that time, we didn't have any baseball team that was farther west or south than St. Louis. Nobody went out to Arizona in those days. 
And coming from, you, could, you had to come from Ohio or Pennsylvania to be pre or New York to be president. But anyway, <clears throat> we all picked on uh, Barry Goldwer as the guy we wanted. So he had to have a book too. So he had a book. You gotta run, when you run for president, you have to have a book. And his book called The Conscience of a Conservative, which soon came out in paperback also, had a big sale. And we all know that actually the book was written by Brent Bozell, who's the father of the guy who runs uh, that media organization today. And, uh, but Dean Mannion, Dean Clarence Mannion, gave it the title. And this is the first time people began to call themselves conservative. After the conscience of a conservative came out, this was kind of proof that conservatives were not heartless people. They really had a conscience. And we began proudly to call ourselves conservatives. <clears throat> and so um, we um, uh, were studying all the time, reading widely, uh, reading the, the books of the ex-communists like uh, uh, Boudin's and uh, Whitaker Chambers and so forth, knowing what it was all about, <clears throat> and uh, beginning to plan for Barry Goldwater. Uh, we made a try for him in Chicago in 1960, and that's when we didn't have enough votes, and Barry Goldwater came out on the stage and said, uh, conservatives, this isn't our year. Go home and I'll see you in four years. And so that's what we did, and we distributed his book and did some more studying. And one of the major factors in building the ranks of the conservatives was this paperback called None Dare Call It Treason by John Stormer. It was a little longer than some of these other paperbacks, but it really set forth what had happened to our country and the dangers of communism and the danger of central planning and the dangers of... Uh, of uh, an overgrown bureaucracy and high taxation and so forth. He published it himself and he sold seven million copies. And, and that was a major educational tool of the grassroots who are now beginning to come alive. Now, as we approached the 1964 convention of the Republican Party, uh, which was in um, Chicago, in 19, 1964, um, I had kind of had a hobby of Republican national conventions, and I had been to all of them beginning in 52. And most of the people who go to Republican conventions as delegates are first-timers. The majority of them have never been before, and they don't know what to expect and, and don't know how it really operates. And I figured they ought to know what went before. so. I wrote my little book called A Choice Not an Echo, and uh, I plunged in getting a printing of 25,000. I thought that would be it. I ended up selling three million out of my garage. And they went to all the people who were delegates who were interested in the next nomination, and um, it had a tremendous impact. Every, every week I meet some public official who says, I came into the conservative movement reading A Choice Not an Echo in 1964. Uh, most uh, political literature just simply revs up your juices for your prejudices, but mine was persuasive. Goldwater's opponent was Nelson Rockefeller, a former New York governor. And uh, my book persuaded Rockefeller people to switch and support Goldwater and persuaded Lyndon Johnson people to switch and support Goldwater. So we had the 1964 convention and we nominated Goldwater. That was the conservatives taking over the Republican Party. And then, as you know, Goldwater went down to a smashing defeat for many reasons uh, we don't have time to talk about here. But at any rate, 27 million people voted for uh, uh, Goldwater and they never regretted it. And that was the, really the start of coming together of the conservative movement. Now, conservatives then developed a kind of a complex. Because of this defeat, we kind of thought, well, I guess we can't really elect a real conservative president. And that's why we uh, went for Nixon on the next round, 
we thought he was the best we could do, which turned out to be a mistake. <coughs> but in, in any event, the conservative movement was there, and the anti-communist movement was there. But that wasn't enough. And then something else happened. Congress voted out a new constitutional amendment supported by the feminists called the Equal Rights Amendment. Everybody was for it. it, it, it the support, uh, well, there were only 23 people in the House who voted against it. There were only, I think, eight in the Senate who voted against it. Uh, uh, President Nixon, President Ford, and President Carter were all enthusiastic supporters of it. All the governors, uh, the media was 99% in favor of it. Everybody was for it. Everybody who was anybody in politics, from left to right, from Ted Kennedy to George Wallace, they all endorsed it. And um, I was asked to speak about it and made a speech about it, which then turned up in my Phyllis Schlafly report, which I had started a few years before. It's looked exactly the same for 45 years. Phyllis Schlafly report. And I wrote one called, What's Wrong with Equal Rights for Women? And uh, sent it out to my friends. I sold this, the, mag the uh, report by subscription for $5 a year. So they're mostly, mostly women I had worked with in the Republican Party. And uh, one day the next month, uh, one of them called up and said, Phyllis, we took your report to the legislature and they voted down the Equal Rights Amendment. And so then I thought we had something. And I invited 100 women from 30 states to uh, meet me in St. Louis. And I put them on a bus and took them down to the riverfront and we went on one of these showboats, and I climbed up on the stage where they do all these melodramas, and I told them, we're going to go out and beat the Equal Rights Amendment. At that point, nobody thought it was possible. They thought we were crazy, because in the first year, the ERAers got 30 states. They only needed 38, three-fourths of the country. So we took it on, and it's, uh, it's a long story, um, <clears throat> but... Uh, we had big fights in state after state. Uh, in Illinois, it was, the, it was the front line. And Illinois voted on it every year for 10 years. And we kept beating them, and they kept coming back. Uh, five states that had previously voted for it rescinded. And uh, this was not a battleground in every state, but the main battlegrounds were Illinois, Florida, and North Carolina, and uh, a little bit in uh, uh, Missouri and Oklahoma, and then the rescinding states. And uh, we kept beating them. And um, when ERA came, I'll tell you about, and I haven't got time to tell you all the things wrong with it, but uh, they offered this amendment to put women in the Constitution. Well, you've read the Constitution. You know men are not in the Constitution. It's a completely sex-neutral document. It only talks about citizens, persons, electors, presidents, uh, and we the people. It's all completely sex-neutral. Women have had every constitutional right men have since the day it was uh, written. And uh, so that was a fraud. They were not able to offer any benefit to women. I testified in 41 state legislative hearings, and in only one state did uh, one of their people come in and say, our state has a law that discriminates that ERA will remedy. They had a law that said that wives could not make homemade wine without their husband's consent. So for this, we need a constitutional amendment? You gotta be kidding. And but when they went on TV, they thought, they made women think, ERA was going to give them a raise, but ERA would have nothing to do with uh, employment because the employment laws were already sex neutral. And what ERA would do would be to make every law sex neutral. And uh, the classic discriminatory law was the draft law. And we were then in the Vietnam War, we had a draft, and uh, my daughters, I had daughters and sons that age, and. They thought it was the craziest thing anybody said. Are you going to give women uh, a constitutional amendment and the first thing is they have to sign up for the draft like their brothers? You've got to be kidding. It was unsaleable. 
And, uh, but anyway, it went on. Now, when ERA came out of Congress, they were given a time limit of seven years. And as they were moving along, they realized they might not make it. And so Bella Abzug was then in Congress. You remember, she's a funny woman with the hats. And uh, she got Congress to give her $5 million to have a special uh, convention in Houston, which was supposed to be used to uh, ratify the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. And um, they had their meeting, and it was an enormous media event. There were 3,000 media people who went to Houston to cover this. This, you know, the feminists had so much free press all the time. And uh, they were there and giving them great coverage. Well, uh, the feminists passed their resolution saying they wanted the Equal Rights Amendment. But then that didn't satisfy them. They began to tell the rest of their agenda. They said they wanted abortion funded by the taxpayers. So they had a big thing about that. And for all these resolutions, they're letting off balloons and they're prancing around. And uh, <clears throat> then the next one was they uh, endorsed the whole list of gay rights. And we're talking about 1977 now. This was not agreeable to the American people, but they're putting all this on television. They're all prancing around with these victories. Uh, they wanted uh, universal uh, government-supported daycare. You have to understand the feminists. The feminists believe that women are victims of the patriarchy. And it's, it's up to new laws and the Constitution to remedy this second-class citizenship of women. Absolutely false. The American women are the most fortunate class of people who ever lived on the face of the earth. We can do anything we want to do. And, but anyway, that's the line they're putting out. And their prime example of the oppression of women by the patriarchy is that society expects mothers to look after their babies. And that burden has got to be lifted from them by the taxpayers. And we need to have government-run and regulated daycare. So they passed all these resolutions. And they whooped it up and had a big old time. And, and every important, well-known feminist was there doing this. Uh, uh, Betty Friedan was making an impassioned plea to invite the lesbians to come and join them. And um, they um, passed all the resolutions. And I remember uh, after that was over, uh, somebody asked the Missouri governor one day, uh, are you, governor, are you for the Equal Rights Amendment? Well, he said, do you mean the old ERA or the new ERA? He said, I was for equal pay for equal work. But after they went down to Houston and got tangled up with all those abortionists and lesbians, I can tell you ERA will never pass in Missouri. And of course, he was absolutely right. And after that convention, they never got it. They never won another vote. Uh, ERA has probably been voted on 25 times since then in various committees or legislatures or even referenda. And is it never won anywhere else. It, the, their, their own $5 million conference, uh, which they were so proud of, uh, simply destroyed them. And, um, but the fight went on because then they ran to, to Jimmy Carter and got him to give them a three-year extension. And uh, the cartoonists had a field day with this. This was like giving a baseball game three more innings when it, the game was not tied up. And, uh, but they did not get any more states. And uh, they, uh, they didn't get it. And in, um, at the end of the first seven years, which we considered the real end, because that was the constitutional part, and we considered the the extension illegal, which a court did finally hold. The extension was illegal. And um, so um, we had a victory party in, uh, in 1979, which was the end of the seven years. And we proclaimed victory over. And the, the press was so angry at me, they could hardly stand it. You're not supposed to win. You're not going to win. Uh, the extension is there. and. Um, but uh, 
it was important for all of these conservatives uh, left over from the uh, Goldwater campaign to realize that it was possible to win. Now the significant thing that happened in this ERA fight, when I started out, I was holding my finger in the dike with a handful of my Republican women friends. And we'd go to the state legislature and we were being successful. And then I realized uh, about 1976 uh, that we were going to need more uh, help. And so that's when I decided, where, where am I going to get more help? So that's when I went to the churches. And please come and join us. And uh, I prayed that we could bring a thousand people to Springfield, Illinois, for a demonstration. And uh, that was the day on, uh, I think it was April 26, 1976, that a thousand people did come to Springfield, Illinois. And our legislature had never seen anything like this before. And they came and showed them that we were opposed to ERA. So that is the day we invented the pro-family movement. Now, in, in building my organization of, uh, first of all, Stop ERA, and then it morphing into Eagle Forum, uh, I was very ecumenical. Uh, I didn't let him talk about religion. Uh, we, I combined the Catholics, the Protestants of all the denominations, the evangelicals, uh, the Jews, uh, the Mormons, I had them all in there. And the message is, I don't care what your church is, we're all going to work together to beat the Equal Rights Amendment. And I made them all get along. And this was, the, this was the first time, I can tell you, this was the first time a lot of Catholics and Baptists were in the same room together. <laughs> <coughs> and they just had to get along. That's, uh, that's just my policy. And so it was quite a coalition that we had. And uh, when they all came together uh, at this 1,000-person uh, demonstration at the Capitol, it was a visual demonstration of the pro-family movement. And then uh, we swell, really swelled our ranks when the Baptists joined us. And that's when Jerry Falwell started his moral majority. And when he came to another demonstration, we actually had 10,000 people at another demonstration at the Springfield Capitol. So this is the building of the pro-family movement. And realizing that people of faith and people who had similar values uh, could work together for a goal they shared. Now, initially, uh, the uh, Roe v. Wade and abortion was not playing that role. Because when Roe v. Wade was handed down by the court in 1973, uh, the Catholic bishops jumped in to fight it. Well. The Protestants were not going to join up with something the Catholic bishops were running. So they hung back. And it was several years before the Protestants came in. Of course, they did finally, and they've now taken, kind of taken over the movement, and that's just fine. Everybody's working together fine uh, against uh, abortion. But it was in um, about uh, 1976 that we realized that one of the reasons the feminists wanted ERA was they felt it was the key to locking abortion funding into the Constitution. The Supreme Court had handed down a decision, the Harris v. Roe decision, which said you did not have a constitutional right to have your abortion paid for. But they wanted it paid for, and they thought they could get that through ERA because they would charge that it was sex discriminatory to deny this money. And of course, they've made that case in a number of courts, and they've made it elsewhere, too. Uh, but that showed that if you were for ERA, you were also abor for abortion. And so they joined ranked with, ranked with us uh, finally. And uh, that tended to continue to build the pro-family movement. And eventually, it took on other issues also. But that was the start when we put it together. Now, when they had their big shindig in Houston in 1977, financed by the taxpayers, we took another hall across town in Houston and invited people to come at their own expense 
and to attend our pro-family rally. And uh, we packed uh, 20,000 people into a hall that was only supposed to hold 18,000. And they all came at their own expense. And uh, I think that's the day pro-family movement went into the political vocabulary, because that's what we called ourselves. And that would have been in, uh, uh, in 1976. So um, the fight went on, uh, but eventually they didn't get any more states after that Houston uh, convention, and we won, and they haven't gotten over it yet. They're still fighting about it. But it's a, it's a ridiculous proposal, and uh, it, it is really kind of an inspiring tale that a, a little group of grassrooters could take on the entire establishment and, and beat them. And, and I want to tell you, we just had everybody against us. We had, gov we had governors who marched against us in the picket line. We had every, the, the media was hammering us constantly. And uh, yet, we, we were able to make our case, uh, stick, on, stick to the facts, argue how ERA was going to hurt women, and uh, we were ultimately uh, successful. Uh, we were nice to the legislators. The, uh, the feminists would, uh, they would really talk nasty to them. In fact, in the, as the last few days in Illinois, they did things like having a chain gang chain themselves to the door of our Senate chamber. So the senators had to step over them to get into their seats. And then one day they went to the slaughterhouse and got plastic vials of pig's blood and came back and wrote on our marble floors the names of the people they hated the most. They didn't understand that didn't get them any more votes. <laughs> Meanwhile, we were doing things like sending the, the legislators valentines and, <laughs> and br bringing them home-baked bread and, and, and being nice to them. And uh, ultimately, ultimately, we won. But uh, that, was the, that was the start of uh, what we now call the pro-family the pro movement that has played such a big part. Now. After we pro proclaimed victory in, uh, in 1978, uh, uh, then you see the next big thing coming up was the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. And uh, uh, it was, a lot of us were not sure we could win. You know, we didn't have a vision of victory in the conservative movement those days. We were working for him. You know, conservative mindset in those days, we're going to pass out our literature and do our thing, but we're probably not going to win. But anyway, uh, what Reagan did was there were not enough people left over from the Goldwater voters to elect a president, but he successfully and skillfully combined the fiscal conservatives left over from the Goldwater campaign, the people who'd been brought in to the anti-communist movement who cared about national defense, and the people have been brought into the pro-family movement through Stop ERA and the Fight for Life. And uh, he won a great victory in 80 and 84. And uh, so you need those three legs in order to win. You, can't, you really can't win with one of them. But uh, Reagan proved that that is the, the key to success, and uh, that's what they did. And, uh, uh, it was, um, the ERA fight was a fight well worth making. It's, it's an inspiring tale of how grassrooters can really take over and beat the whole establishment. And uh, we've now since then been in um, many other issues. Uh, the successful candidates are people who can combine uh, the, the different legs. You all don't, all the voters don't have to agree on everything. But if they can all agree on their candidate, that's great. And each one of those groups saw in Ronald Reagan a way of achieving their goal. And that's, uh, that is why he won. And uh, when uh, candidates now say we're going to put the, the social issues or the moral issues in the deep freeze or the back burner, they're making a terrible mistake because they're kicking away large blocks of voters who are important to their victory. And so I feel that the uh, pro-family movement has played a tremendous role. And uh, there are so many people who came into the Republican Party 
uh, through these social and moral issues. And uh, it's uh, uh, just, uh, is there trend, so many other issues they care about. We got into the issue of marriage, which is another social issue. And uh, I'm sure that this part of the conservative movement was very influential in passing about 30 constitutional amendments in support of traditional marriage and passing the DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act by Congress, wonderful law that uh, Obama is not enforcing. You know, one of the principal duties of the president is to see that the laws are faithfully executed. He's not faithfully executing DOMA. In fact, he's got his uh, attorney general trying to beat it through uh, getting some uh, supremacist judge to throw it out. And uh, that's just one of many ways he's been violating the Constitution. But the, the people who care about the moral issues are extremely important to the conservative constituency. And uh, they have to be kept part of it. Uh, human motivation is, is very uh, complex. And it's the decline in marriage, marriage rates, that is the chief reason for the enormous amount of welfare and the enormous numbers of people who are being supported at taxpayer expense. We've now got 47% of the American people who are existing in whole or in part on government. And uh, we don't want to build a nation of dependent people. We want, a, we want a nation of people who can make their own way. I mean, I grew up during the Great Depression. We didn't look to government. Government wasn't any help at all. And now we've got uh, more than 40 programs which funnel uh, cash or benefits uh, to people who are not married, mostly. They say it's for the children. Well, it's encouraging women to have children without getting married. It's a terrible mistake. They're going to be poor. You ought to tell them you're going to be poor all your life if you do that. But they're existing by the government. And uh, so uh, there are all of these social and moral issues that are so important. The, the welfare part of our budget is the fastest growing and the biggest part. There, it's, it's now even more money than we're spending on national defense. And um, Obama knows that. That's why they're trying to increase the number of single moms, because they all, they all vote for Obama, or most of them do, because that's where they're getting their support. So there are many of these social issues that are absolutely vital and uh, it is necessary that we have uh, that part of the constituency to vote for a president. So uh, do we have time to take a few questions? We will. We'll, we're going to be right back with some questions. We'll be, we'll be back with questions. We're going to reset and we'll be back with questions. Oh, okay. So 